On this week's episode of Ride the Lightning, the Tesla unofficial podcast, Tesla hits a major production milestone with the Model 3. Autopilot boss Andre Karpathy gives a talk on vision-only autopilot. Giga Berlin shows another sign of significant progress and more. What's happening, friends? Ryan McCaffrey here with you for episode 308 of Ride the Lightning, your weekly Tesla unofficial podcast for June 27th, 2021. And not alongside me this particular week is Daisy the Boxer, but it's okay. She is fine. She is fine. She is uh, at home with our awesome dog sitter. I want to say hi from San Diego. We are here with uh, with my in-laws this week. It's our first actual getaway of any kind since the pandemic started, so... Uh, thank you, modern science, for the miracle of vaccines that allowed us to feel comfortable enough to, to do a little escape. It's my first week not working proper, like just not actually really paying attention to work stuff and taking a proper vacation in, in over a year. And, and again, I mean, I'm grateful uh, that I have a job, so I don't want to make it seem like I'm I'm uh, oh, just I've been working so hard now. It's I I'm happy to be working, but it's also nice now to just take a pause, take a week and, and get out of the house, go somewhere different. So, yeah, I'm uh, I'm going full zony this week. Those of you in Arizona know what that means. Although, of course, I haven't lived in Arizona in roughly 20 years now. But still, yeah, it's it's been fun actually to see as an Arizona sports fan to see so many Arizona sports T-shirts and hats and things, all kinds of Diamondback shirts and Sun shirts and jerseys and things down here, especially as the Suns are now knee deep in the Western Conference Finals going farther than I think most of us ever thought they would this season. We'll see where that ends up. But anyway... I am happy to be here with you for, again, episode 308. And a quick follow-up from last week before I get started with the news proper. Uh, I did mention the $10,000 price increase on the Plaid Model S, and uh, I had mentioned how the Plaid X is still $120,000, $10,000 cheaper. It has not seen a matching price increase. And as of when I record this, which I'm recording a little earlier than normal, it's Friday afternoon here instead of the usual Friday late night, but it is still 120000 for the Plaid X as I record this, but I wanted to just uh, catch up on one thing I didn't mention, and I want to say thank you to Michael from the Tesla Owners Club of Taiwan for reminding me about this, is that the Plaid Plus order holders, obviously the Plaid Plus is as of now discontinued, those people had their orders converted to regular plaid, but unfortunately it happened at the higher price, even though plaid plus orders were all taken before the price increase. Now, thankfully, this was not only flagged to Elon on Twitter, it was addressed by Elon on Twitter, and it is being rectified, so I'm happy to see that. It's the right thing to do, and and I give uh, I want to give Tesla the benefit of the doubt on this one because I don't think that they did this maliciously or intentionally. My guess is that When those Plaid Plus orders were converted to regular Plaid in their system, it just automatically put them at the current price. But obviously, it's it's you know it doesn't make sense for those people that had in orders prior to that price increase to have to pay that higher price. So I am glad that Tesla is correcting that as they should. Now, something for Tesla to celebrate. This week, and I wonder if we will see any public acknowledgement of it, probably in the earnings call uh, coming up, which I guess the earnings call is going to be in roughly a month from now. You know, it's June 25th as I record this. They've been having the earnings calls within that first month after the end of a quarter. So I think probably about four weeks from now. But in any case, the point I'm making here is this Tesla has manufactured its one millionth Model 3. A source at Tesla sent me photographic proof in the form of a VIN screen. You know, if you go into your into your uh, interface there and you can check and see the VIN number of your car and all the, you know, the information about it. So I was sent 
pictorial evidence of this, of a yet-to-be-delivered Model 3, it's been built but not yet delivered, that confirms that Tesla has, uh, to use the automotive phrase here, they've, they've rolled the odometer over, the manufacturing odometer, if you will, and surpassed 1 million Model 3s made. And they've done it just almost exactly one month shy of the car's official fourth birthday. You know, it was the end of July in 2017 when the Model 3 officially went into production. Well, it's officially started delivery. So now uh, the the proof that I was sent was not of the exact one millionth car. Although if any of you out there that, that have uh, a Model 3 you're waiting delivery on right now, if any of you out there happen to take delivery of that car, please let me know because that would just be pretty cool to know and pretty cool to celebrate. That, and In fact, I wonder if the owner of that car will even realize that they have VIN 1 million. But uh, I was also sent by that same Tesla source a picture of another VIN, just a few, not very many cars at all, shy of 1 million. So kind of one on one before, one after. And so the, the one VIN was had a whole bunch of nines in it, and then the other one was just a bit over the 1 million mark. So again, I want to say congratulations to everyone at Tesla on this major milestone. I mean, the Model 3, it really, it has been the accelerant for Tesla's success. There's a lot that's gone in to Tesla's success and their financial stability here. Because you guys remember, if you've been following this for a while, things were really bumpy for a while there in the early, you know, that first year or so of Model 3's life that, that you know, financially the company was in on shaky ground, things were not great. And now you fast forward four years and look how well the company is doing. And the, and the Model 3 is the catalyst for that. Obviously, yes, you know, the S and the X have continued to be there. And the Model Y has has been a big accelerant of things as well. But the Model 3 has really been the catalyst for the, the now sustained success that Tesla finds themselves enjoying. So, Congratulations to the entire, to ev- literally every single person in the company that is that has contributed to this in some way. And when you think about it, this is the first time that Tesla has reached this 1 million car milestone as far as a single model, but it certainly will not be the last because the Model Y is going to get there next, and I suspect it'll get there within a couple years. I don't think it'll be very long because... The Model Y should get there much quicker than the Model 3 did because not only did the Y hit the ground running uh, production-wise a lot better than the 3 did, but the Y uh, is being made in, 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 within a year from now, one year from right now, there will be four factories turning out Model Ys, Fremont, Shanghai, Texas, and Berlin, versus the Model 3, which is made in two places today, Fremont and Shanghai. You look out a little further, the Cybertruck should get to a million units in time within probably four years because you, you figure they'll start slow, right? They, they always start a little pretty slow, generally speaking. So if they really do have a run rate of 250 to 300,000 a year, which is what Elon had said to me when I asked him the question back at Battery Day, it's all right, quarter million or so a year, should take them, you know, within five years, they'll they'll no doubt get there. And then, of course, the $25,000 car, the yet-to-be-revealed but already discussed super mass market, super high volume $25,000 Tesla, that is certainly going to get there as well, and it will probably get there more quickly than any of the other Teslas have done so. And I guess, given enough time, the Model S should make it as well. It's certainly been in production the longest but its volume has been relatively low. And obviously, up until just a couple weeks ago, there were zero Model S's manufactured and delivered uh, in, in 2021, up until you know just a, a bit into June there. And then even the Model X. The Model X will probably get there as well. It's a, it's a few years behind the Model S. For, uh, but it, and it's, its run rate is about the same as the Model S is. So there you go. Lots of, a lot of uh, future success to look forward to, but in the meantime, we toast the Model 3. Now, speaking of the Model 3, Tesla has built a custom Model 3 performance for the UK, for the government, 
for them to evaluate for possible police use. This came in via listener Rob Borley. Thank you, Rob. And the story comes from Inside EVs, who writes, As the United Kingdom is looking to enforce a ban on the sale of all internal combustion engine vehicles by the year 2030, it will have to shift its emergency vehicle fleet to electric as well. And it's already started testing electric vehicles in these roles to see whether or not they are suitable, which is how this custom Tesla Model 3 came about. It is officially built by Tesla UK, according to Auto Express, and it will be given to the police force to gauge its suitability. And what I want to say about this is, number one, smart move on Tesla's part to put this performance Model 3 together for them, because uh, Tesla has every reason to be confident that the federal and also local governments in the UK are going to love the car and see the financial uh, benefits, certainly, but also not to mention environmental benefits because, you know, police cars idle a lot. That's just sort of the nature of the beast. But those benefits, the the environmental and more sort of directly and obviously financial benefits are going to be clear by going with a Tesla when they test this thing out. And if and when that conversion happens and, and the UK decides to go with more of these, that, that just means Tesla ends up selling the government a whole lot of cars, plenty more than would be needed, no doubt, to offset the cost of this one test car. So it's sort of a first taste is free kind of situation for the, the UK government and the, uh, the UK police enforcement, the police, police department. Now, one thing that I suspect probably won't last on this car, or, or at worst, it won't make it to any future Teslas that the UK government buys are the 20 inch Uber turbine wheels, which are on this car. Uh, it would certainly make a lot more sense for a high mileage police cruiser to not have those tires because uh, the Michelins on my car last about 15 to 18,000 miles or so, which isn't much. And I have heard, though I can't say with certainty just yet that the Pirelli tires that the new performance Model 3s come with don't even quite last as long as the Michelins do. That, uh, and you're also with those 20-inch wheels and the lower-profile tires, you're at a higher risk for tire damage from things like potholes uh, as well as uh, you know other little road hazards. And by the way, take it from me on that. If you've been listening to the podcast for a few years, <laughs> you know of the troubles, the, the frequent and numerous troubles I have had with uh, with punctures and potholes in my tires. So, yeah, I don't think the UK government will stick with those 20s long term. I, I think it would be wise of Tesla, either Tesla or the UK police department, who are, who's going to be managing this particular car, to swap the 20s for 18s. Now, on the flip side, with the Performance Model 3, uh, tire whatever tires and wheels they have on there, the police are going to have... Zero problems running down any suspects who decide they want to try and escape the police. (laughs) Or, I mean, really, as a far more everyday and less dramatic example, a speed trap. You know, if somebody flies, just flies by the speed trap at well over the speed limit, and the, the police officer driving that Model 3 police cruiser decides to go pull them over, well, a performance Model 3 can go from zero to pulling that car over very, very quickly. But in any case, I wish the UK police force very well with this car. I suspect they will have a good time with it, and the fueling and maintenance costs are, I I can almost guarantee, are going to result in a very obvious win for the Tesla and for the, the UK government here. Let's stay on the topic of Model 3 for a little bit longer. It has topped Cars.com's 2021 list of the most American cars. So the this little write-up comes via, of course, Cars.com, who says, For the second year in a row, Cars.com's American-made index ranks all qualifying vehicles built and bought in the U.S., not just the top 10 or 15 models. With results directly comparable to those of the 2020 American-made index, the 2021 study ranks 90 vehicles through the same five major criteria assembly location, parts content, engine origins, transmission origins, and U.S. manufacturing workforce. 
Tesla has the number one spot for the first time in the index's 16 year history. The California electric vehicle makers compact sedan, the Model 3, I mean, it's not a compact sedan, it's a midsize, but all right, topped the number two Ford Mustang to lead the index for 2021. The Tesla Model Y, Jeep Cherokee, and Chevrolet Corvette rounded out the top five models. So there you go. Tesla has the number one spot and the number three spot, which is pretty darn cool. And also, not to come off as a you know fanboy here, I hope this doesn't come off this way, but I'm honestly just genuinely curious, what about the Model Y bumps it down to number three? How is it not number two or basically tied for number one with the Model 3? Because as we know, the Model Y shares a lot of parts with the Model 3, and it's also built in Fremont, California, and it also shares the same battery pack, the same drivetrain, same motors, but still, uh, good to see the Mustang and the Corvette on this list as well. I love it. You know, on that note, an electric version of either of those cars would be really, really fun, wouldn't it? I mean, no disrespect to the Mustang Mach-E SUV, but that's not what I'm talking about. A, a proper Mustang electric would be really fun. You just throw two motors in that thing, make it a dual motor, give it a good enough battery pack, big enough pack for some good range, good power draw. That would be fun. And then the Corvette team, I mean, the, the, the Corvette team already accomplishes basically miracles for the amount of money they charge and the amount of car you get. Boy, seeing them go electric with a vet, that would be fun too. Anyway, I'm getting off track here. Um, I suppose the the final point I can make on this particular recognition that Tesla has, get, has received here from cars.com is that if you ever run into any fudsters in your life in conversation at a party or whatever, somebody who's got a bone to pick about Tesla or may just be otherwise, you know, innocently misinformed, you can point them to this list to counter whatever strange argument that they might make about what these cars are, where they come from, and who makes them. Say it's Tesla, it's an American company in California, and go to cars.com and you'll see that it's that they have two of the three, you know, most American-made cars in the entire country. So, more good stuff for Tesla. All right, I'm going to spend some time now uh, going through some clips and analysis of a presentation. There was a 40-minute presentation this week from Andre Carpathy, the head of autopilot at Tesla, and it was th the point of the presentation was it was it took place at the workshop on autonomous driving. If you'd like to watch slash listen to the entire 40-minute presentation, it is on YouTube, and it's the so the whole workshop is eight and a half hours long. And uh, Andre Carpathy's section was the final 40 minutes of it. So if you just search Workshop on Autonomous Driving on YouTube, you will find this. But here's the first clip that I want to play you. Here's Andre explaining why Tesla is doing the autonomy. Why are they trying to make autonomous cars a thing? And I think, unfortunately, we're kind of like in a bad shape when it comes to transportation in society. And uh, basically, the issue is that we have these metallic objects traveling incredibly quickly um, and with very high kinetic energy, and we are putting meat in the control loop uh, in the, into the system. And so this is quite undesirable. And really, fundamentally, what it comes down to is people are not very good at driving. They get into a lot of trouble uh, in accidents. Uh, they don't want to drive. Um, and also, in terms of economics, we are involving people in transportation. And of course, we'd like to automate transportation and really uh, reap the benefits of that automation in society. Uh, so we all, I think, are on the same page that it should be possible to replace the meat computer with a silicon computer and get a lot of benefits out of it in terms of um, safety and convenience and uh, economics. So in particular, uh, silicon computers have significantly low latencies. They have 360 degree situational awareness. Uh, they are fully attentive and never check their Instagram and uh, alleviate all of the issues that are presented. And so I think uh, this is not super shocking and a lot of people have been kind of really looking forward to this kind of a future. Uh, this is a frame from iRobot, uh, a really good movie if you haven't seen it. And here, Will Smith is about to drive a car manually. And uh, this other person here is shocked that this is going to happen. This is ridiculous. Like, why would you actually have a human driving cars? Um, and so I think this is uh, not very far from truth. And this movie is taking place in 2035. Uh, so I think by then, um, I actually think this is a pretty uh, present prediction. 
It would be pretty cool if fully autonomous driving ends up being as common and normal as, say, smartphones in 14 years from now, not only as a general societal safety and convenience thing. I mean, think of the increase in productivity if you don't have to drive yourself, as well as the mobility for those folks who are currently unable to drive themselves for whatever reason. But uh, it'd also be pretty cool because nobody would ever have expected iRobot to be an accurate predictor of the real life future. All right. If you are curious about the Tesla autopilot team and how many people are training the beta and and sort of testing it as well as the examples that they've been running locally in the San Francisco Bay Area. Take a listen to this clip. Uh, The team is um, working primarily on the FSD functionality, which is our uh, full self-driving suite. So here we have about FS, we have the FSD beta product and it's in the hands of about 2000 customers. And this is an example from one of the customers driving around San Francisco. And uh, these people are posting videos on YouTube so you can check out a lot of videos. But what we're showing here on the instrument cluster is we're showing all of our predictions. So you're seeing some road edges, uh, some lines, some objects. Um, and the car of course is navigating around autonomously here in San Francisco environment. Um, Now, we, of course, drive this extensively as engineers. uh, And uh, so it's actually fairly routine for us to have zero intervention drives, I would say, in like sparsely populated areas like Palo Alto and so on. I would say we definitely struggle a lot more in uh, very adversarial environments like San Francisco. A lot of people working in autonomy, of course, know all about that as well. I just want to point out that I appreciate that Andre admits the uphill battle, uh, like literally and figuratively speaking, that San Francisco is. I have watched the San Francisco videos, and uh, granted, it was in an earlier beta state than what we're going to see in our cars and what's what's in development now, but I'm not sure that the beta as it was is any less stressful than driving manually in my particular driver's nightmare of a city. I mean, I'm not surprised at all that Palo Alto, with, with hey, no disrespect to that absolutely beautiful town has zero intervention drives. When we start seeing that in San Francisco, I will be particularly impressed. And again, hey, I'm not claiming that San Francisco is the toughest or the only tough place to drive. There are plenty of those in the United States and around the world. But I'm absolutely saying that it is a tough place to drive. What with all of our narrow streets, massively steep hills, one-way streets, Cars parked on the street everywhere were on two-way streets where only one car can get through at a time, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, the, the nice thing is San Francisco is the autopilot teams. Basically, they have a their own local acid testing grounds where it's if, if it can work here, it can probably work anywhere. It's also interesting to hear that 2,000 people have the beta so far. And I imagine that most of those are internal Tesla employees and that the public testers that we've seen posting the aforementioned videos on YouTube and social media for a while now are part of a very, very, very tiny external group, at least for now, for now. May we be blessed with the button very soon. All right, now let's hear about what a good example of data, what a good, clean example of autopilot data looks like for Andre and his team. We've ended up developing 221 triggers uh, manually uh, that we were using to source data from our customer fleet. And this is just an example, um, some examples of the 221 triggers that were used to collect all of these uh, diverse scenarios. So for example, we have um, shadow mode where we deploy a neural network that is pretty good at predicting depth and velocity. And what we do is we run it silently in the cars of our customers but it's not actually connected to control. What's driving is the legacy stack. But we're, we're, we're basically running the new measurements of depth and velocity, and we're, for example, looking at whether or not they agree or disagree with the legacy stack or with the radar. We're looking for other sources of jank, like, for example, if there's bonding box jitter, detection jitter, the main and the narrow camera disagree. Um, we predict that there's a harshly decelerating object, but the person seems to not mind. Um, all kinds of disagreements between different neural network uh, signals um, and you know, there's a there's a long list here. Um, it took us a while to actually perfect these triggers, and all of them are iteration. And you're looking at what's coming back. You're tuning your trigger, and uh, you're sourcing data from all these scenarios. So, basically, over the last four months, we've done quite extensive data engine. 
we've ended up doing seven shadow modes and seven loops around this data engine here, where on the top right is where you begin. You have some seed data set. You train your neural network on your data set and you deploy the neural network in the customer cars in shadow mode. And the network is silently making predictions. And then you have to have some mechanisms for sourcing inaccuracies of the neural net. So you're just looking at its predictions. Um, and then you're using one of these triggers, like I described, you're getting these scenarios where the network is probably misbehaving. Some of those clips end up going to unit tests to make sure that we, even if we're failing right now, we make sure we pass later. And in addition, those examples are being auto-labeled and incorporated into a training set. And then as a asynchronous process, we're also always data cleaning the current training set. And so we spin this loop over and over again until the network basically becomes incredibly good. So in total, we've done seven rounds of shadow mode for this release. Um, we've accumulated 1 million extremely hard, diverse clips. Uh, and these are videos. So these are, you should roughly think about say 10 second clips, 36 FPS, something like that. In total, we have about 6 billion objects labeled cleanly for depth and velocity. And this takes up roughly 1.5 petabytes of uh, storage. Uh, so that gives us a really good data set. Just kind of a random thought here in the middle of this presentation as I was listening to the whole thing. Andre Carpathy, I would guess, first of all, he's he just in a vacuum must be getting paid a fortune at Tesla because this is world leading stuff at this point. He and his team are doing things that to my, I guess, pea brain knowledge, I don't, I'm not in this field, but I don't know of anybody else in the world that's doing this in the way that Tesla is doing it. I would not be surprised at all if Andre Carpathy might be the highest paid employee at the company because we know that Elon doesn't take a salary. Granted, his stock compensation is through the roof. So if you want to measure by that, then sure, Elon is still at the top of the food chain there. But, you know, Elon has described in the recent past he has described autonomy as Tesla's biggest priority. So also couple that with if Andre ever left, I would imagine that he would be very difficult to replace, which makes him incredibly valuable. Anyway, uh, I've got a few more clips here. Next up, uh, take a listen to how powerful the supercomputing system is that Tesla's using for the autopilot neural nets. So there's actually a fairly significant uh, computer here. Um, we have 10 petabytes of hot tier NVMe storage. And uh, it's also an incredibly fast uh, storage. So I believe 1.6 terabytes per second. This is one of the world's fastest file systems. And uh, we have a 60. We have also a very uh, efficient uh, fabric um, that connects all of this, because of course, if you're doing distributed training across your nodes, you need your gradients to uh, to be synchronized very efficiently. And of course, we are reading all of these videos from the file system, and that requires a really fat byte as well. So uh, this is a pretty incredible supercomputer. Um, and uh, so this is a GPU cluster. Uh, next up, we're really hoping that uh, um, we're currently working on Project Dojo, uh, which will take this to next level, uh, but I'm not ready to sort of reveal any more details about that at this point. Hearing that put into numbers is pretty interesting, I thought at least. Also, those impressive numbers are apparently before Dojo comes online. And thus, Tesla has come nowhere close to hitting their ceiling on this which is really, really fascinating. All right, I've got uh, three more clips for you here. The first one that I want to play is uh, probably going to be of quite relevant interest to a lot of you. It is a technical explanation of phantom braking, which I think many, many of us have encountered. Here's another example, um, fairly infamous example of slowdowns when there are cars uh, going below a bridge. The issue here, again, is that the radar does not have too much vertical resolution. So radar reports a stationary object in front of you, it's as if like the radar doesn't know that there's, if it's, there's like a stationary car in front of you, or if it's the bridge buff, it cannot differentiate those two. So radar thinks that there might be something stationary in front. And it's just like looking for something in vision to tell it that it might be correct. And then we create a stationary target and break. And so in this case, in the legacy vision uh, predictions, which were already producing depth and velocity, but the, because we were using radar, the vision inaccuracies were being masked because, um, your bar is only at radar association. Your bar is not at actual driving. And so the depth and velocity were not held up to high enough bar. And so basically what happens is vision reports a slightly, for a few frames, reports a slightly too negative velocity for the car. And then it associates to the stationary object and the stack is like, oh, that must be the stationary thing. And then you break. And so um, this of course is much cleaner. And you see that the new stack 
uh, does not see this at all, and there's no track, there's no uh, slowdowns in this case, um, because we just get the correct depth and velocity. And Vision obviously has the vertical resolution to differentiate a bridge from a car and whether or not the car is slowing or not. Uh, so again, you could go into the Vision st the radar stack or the sensor fusion stack, and if you have an improved depth and velocity, you could change the fusion strategy. Uh, but again, you're just kind of like doing dead work. Like this signal is so good by itself. Why would you? Why would you do that? Um, so in this in this setting now we've uh, we've improved the situation quite a lot. Well, there you go. The infamous phantom braking explained by the head of autopilot himself. Hopefully, this means that it's going to be rare or extinct altogether in a vision only system before too long. All right, I've had a couple of calls about this. What about infrared to augment a vision system? So uh, Andre was asked about that, and here was his response. Yeah, I think it's an interesting idea. I would say, um, like clearly people, people use vision and the visual spectrum, and uh, they make it work. And so there's an infinity sensors of varying economic costs. Actually, vision and uh, in the visible light spectrum is incredibly cheap sensor, right? So the economics of this are very uh, appealing, and you can actually uh, manufacture and include this at scale. So it's a very cheap and uh, nice sensor. And uh, I would say that basically we have proof from humans that it is um, sufficient. And I would say also that um, vision has all of the information uh, for driving. So I would say that basically vision is necessary and sufficient in my mind. And um, so we're primarily focusing on that. And you could go crazy with, with a lot of sensors, but uh, I think we're definitely currently just like doubling down on that alone. Well, there you go. For those of you who have called in wondering about things like infrared as, again, as I said, a way to augment that vision-only system, sounds like Tesla is not pursuing it. All right, finally, here's just a clip summarizing Andre's entire presentation. Just kind of a nice encapsulating thought here about vision-only autopilot. So in summary, what I try to argue and give you a sense of is uh, vision alone is actually, in our, is our finding that this is perfectly capable of depth sensing. Um, it is an incredibly rich sensor in terms of bandwidth of information. And doing this and matching radar performance and depth and velocity is incredibly hard. I believe it requires the fleet uh, because the data set that we were able to achieve was critical in all these performance uh, improvements. And if you do not have the fleet, I'm not 100% sure how you can source all the difficult and diverse scenarios that we did source. Um, because I believe that was critical to getting this to work. So it's hard, it requires massive networks, a supercomputer, and a, and a data engine and the fleet. Um, but all of these components are coming together in, um, in a vertically integrated fashion at Tesla AI. And I believe that this makes us uh, sort of uniquely positioned in the industry where um, we are barking up the right tree and we have all the puzzle pieces to make this, to make this work. I'll tell you, listening to this did make me really extra excited to see the public beta of City Street's full self-driving, the so-called Beta 9. I am genuinely curious to see now not only the full vision system in action, but also how quickly it will noticeably improve thanks to the neural net after that. All right, speaking of AI, Elon Musk has given an update on AI Day. He has mentioned this before, but now we have a slightly more detailed update here. He tweeted, Looking at holding Tesla AI Day in about a month or so. We'll go over progress with Tesla AI software and hardware, both training and inference. Purpose is recruiting. And then he added, In general, anyone interested in working on physical world AI problems should consider joining Tesla. Fastest path to deploying your ideas is in real life, end quote. Well, number one, I think it's important here to now calibrate your expectations because Elon's already doing so. He says that the purpose of this is recruiting, and as such, I would not expect product updates. I would not expect new product announcements. I expect this to be very, very technical probably more so than Battery Day was last year, and perhaps on par with how technical Autonomy Day was back in 2019, which was also, if you remember that, very, very technical, but still super interesting. Uh, number two, I've got to wonder if this will end up being a combo event with the annual shareholders meeting. I know I said this before, that the last time this came up, I mentioned this, but 
it would seemingly be a lot easier for Tesla to coordinate one big event rather than two smaller ones. I mean, last year they kind of had to combine the battery day and the shareholder meeting because of COVID restrictions on gatherings. And they had that clever workaround by putting everybody in a car, in their own car. This year, the state of California has now fully reopened. So presumably Tesla can do whatever they want. Maybe they're going to end up booking the Computer History Museum and Mountain View for the shareholder meeting, which is where they traditionally have had the shareholder meeting. And maybe it'll be on its own date uh, sometime a bit later in the summer. But I also wouldn't be surprised if they end up getting doubled up and combined, perhaps even at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View. But the bottom line is that this should be an interesting event, even if I end up probably not being smart enough to understand half of what's going to be discussed at it. Uh, Next up this week, another significant update, the full self-driving monthly subscription. No, it's not here yet, but it looks like it will, as it should, be cheaper for those of you who have enhanced autopilot, which will apply to those of you with 2018 and older Teslas, as well as new Tesla owners in Europe. This comes via the Tesla Motors Reddit and user TechDash, who posted this. So thank you, TechDash. And TechDash, found in the JavaScript source code in the Tesla app, it says, well, it says a lot. But the particularly relevant part here is the bit that says when you request, it's when you go to request a refund on your enhanced autopilot package, which you can do, I think, within, I believe it's 48 hours of purchase. And in that JavaScript code attached to that, it says, by refunding Enhanced Autopilot, you will be canceling your full self-driving capability subscription as the monthly price is higher without Enhanced Autopilot. You can resubscribe at any time. So, of course, until this is actually live and we can interact with it directly, I cannot say with 100% certainty that this is going to be the case, but let's be honest. I mean, this is about as close to being a done deal as it possibly can be. It's in the JavaScript code. So again, bravo to TechDash for digging this up. And and quite honestly, it makes sense. If you have paid $5,000 for Enhanced Autopilot, you shouldn't have to pay as much to go the rest of the way, be it from just paying full price once or from a monthly subscription. And by the way, For any of you out there who may be newer to the Tesla community, and you might be listening to this and thinking, wait, what the heck is enhanced autopilot? The short answer is that prior to 2019, Tesla had autopilot broken up differently. It was still two packages, which I guess, I mean, technically, I guess it's one package now. You get the auto, the basic auto steer for, for free within, you know, bundled with the price of the car. But, uh... Back in, before 2019, or excuse me, before 2020, uh, nothing, nothing was included autopilot-wise with the base price of the car. You had to pay $5,000 for enhanced autopilot, which was the, you, that was the first thing you had to get that. If you were going to pay for something, that was, that was checkpoint one. And that gave you everything except full self-driving, which at the time, full self-driving had zero publicly released features of any kind. And then it was an additional $3,000 if you wanted to prepay for FSD. Now, of course, as you men- as I mentioned, you get the basic auto steer included with your car, and it's $10,000 for the full self-driving package, which gives you literally everything else, both present and future. Now, unless, of course, you're in Europe, in which case you currently do have access to Enhanced Autopilot once again. As I've said before, I'm not sure entirely why Europe has that and the USA doesn't. Probably something to do with the uptake rate of FSD uh, in Europe versus in the United States, and possibly, which might also be tied into this, the stricter regulations in Europe that that have kept all of the features that we have here in the US from being rolled out to Europe as of yet. But regardless, uh, I hope that explanation helps for those of you who may not have known about that, who may be a bit newer to the Tesla community. 
Let's see here. I have just a few more Tesla stories. Gosh, another busy week. I'm glad uh, I took a vacation, but glad the show goes on because there's plenty to talk about. Well, the Giga Berlin is the subject of this next story, and it has been spotted doing a paint shop test on the Model Y. The story comes via Tesla Roddy, who writes, The images of the Model Y bodies in the paint shop were captured by drone operator Daniel, who runs the Fly Brandenburg YouTube channel. During a flyover, the drone operator managed to sneak a look through a small opening of Giga Berlin's paint shop building. As luck would have it, two primed Model Y bodies happened to be there. And that's, uh, that's the extent of the relevant excerpt. So... The question remains, who will open first, Berlin or Texas? Now, presumably, both will have the next-gen paint shop that Elon promised a while back. And perhaps those next-gen paint shops will bring with it the deep crimson color that Elon had confirmed uh, to me on Twitter, actually, a while back. And maybe that's going to be one of those one of, one of the new paint options, or hopefully there will be new paint options, and perhaps the Deep Crimson will be among them. I think uh, if you've seen the pictures of Deep Crimson on Elon's Model S, I think that color would look pretty good on the Model Y as well, which of course is what's going to be getting built in Texas and in Berlin. Hey, speaking of paint options, it reminds me that the so-called next-gen paint shop is a big reason why I've been referring to the Texas and Berlin Model Ys as the Model Y 2.0, because they won't just have the new 4680 battery cells and the structural battery pack and the single piece mega castings, but also the new paint shop and thus theoretically, hopefully better quality, more consistent paint jobs, and hopefully some new paint colors as well. But anyway, uh, this is certainly a good sign that things are progressing well in Berlin. Both Berlin and Texas, remember, are supposed to start initial deliveries, not just production, but actual deliveries by the end of this year. And with the rapid progress that we continue to see from these drone, uh, drone flyovers in Texas and this latest one from Berlin, it would anecdotally appear that they're both making pretty good progress towards that goal with still five and a half months left in the year to, to make good on that projection, on that, on that goal. All right, uh, another quick note on the Model Y, by the way, not the greatest of news here, but I have to mention it because that's what I do. I, I pass along relevant Tesla news and talk about it. The Model Y has had its price increased again. Another $500, which puts the cheapest Model Y, the long-range dual motor, $53,000, or okay, if you want to get technical, $52,990. So I believe it's now up $3,000 just this year. It was $49,900 just not too long ago, if you remember. But, you know, the demand is there. Parts and materials costs are tough for Tesla right now, so... This is the end result. I'm certainly not going to cheer it on. You know, it's not fun to see a car that a lot of you out there are wanting to get and saving up to get and planning to buy to see the price on that go up. But that is the unfortunate reality here in the current situation. Finally, this week, let me bring it back around to some good news. The long promised Tesla tequila lightning shaped bottle is now available for sale sans tequila in the online Tesla store. It is labeled as the Tesla Decanter. It's $150. However, it will not include the shot glasses that Elon had mentioned the last time this came up. And when when he said that they were gonna sell just the bottle without the alcohol. Uh, So no shot glasses here, but nevertheless, here's the product description. Inspired by Tesla Tequila, The Tesla decanter is the perfect addition to your home bar. With a lightning bolt silhouette, each hand-blown bottle holds up to 750 milliliters of your favorite spirit. Featuring both a Tesla wordmark and T logo in gold, and cradled atop a polished metal stand for prominent display, this exclusive collectible is ideal for any occasion. And then a note in italics, As each decanter is hand-blown, they will all have their own unique finish, and no two bottles will be identical. (laughs) So, uh, it is still in stock. You know, I've uh, 
just jo- joking voiceover aside there, as of me recording this on Friday afternoon, California time, it's still in stock, so I can't promise it will still be in stock by the time that you most of you hear this on Sunday or later on in the week, but if you are interested, head on over to shop.tesla.com with your fingers crossed and take a look and hopefully it will still be available for you if you want it. All right, that is everything in yet another busy week of Tesla news, but stick with me. The phone the phone calls are back. The Ride the Lightning hotline I promised it would return, and I must hold that promise. So stay tuned for a bunch of your excellent Ride the Lightning Hotline phone calls coming up right after this. It has been too long. Welcome back to the Ride the Lightning Hotline, your chance to be featured on the podcast with your Tesla question, comment, or discussion topic. And I invite you to participate if you've got something Tesla-related on your mind. I'd love to hear from you. You can call in in one of two easy ways. Either way, please try to keep your call to 90 seconds or less so that I can get to as many people each week as possible. But those two easy ways I mentioned, one is just use your smartphone's built-in voice recording software, record the question, and then email the file to me at teslapodcast.com at gmail.com. Alternatively, you can call and leave a message anytime on the Ride the Lightning hotline. It's a toll-free number, and that number is 1-888-989-8752. Again, that's 1-888-989-TSLA. And if you know someone special with an upcoming birthday, anniversary, graduation, or some other special occasion, you can give them a unique gift of recorded voices from friends and family telling them why they're special. The recordings can be podcasted or put onto a keepsake. Visit lifeonrecord.com to learn more. Nathan from North Carolina is up first. Welcome, Nathan. Hey, Ryan. This is Nathan from North Carolina. I'm calling you on Bring Your Dog to Work Day. So I actually have my very own Daisy puppy right here sitting next to me. And fun fact, she gets her name from the one and only Daisy the Boxer Puppy. So she sends her thanks for the awesome name. And also, my wife has no idea. So we'll just keep that between the Tesla community. All right. Uh, My question today has to do with the luxury vehicle segment that Tesla sets in and this removal of the lumbar support. I have a Model 3 on order, expecting delivery in two to three weeks. And it's a little bit of a bummer to find out that now my front passenger seat won't have lumbar support. And I understand Elon's rationale that no one used it looking at the data, but this kind of brings up an interesting point. Like, where's the line that we draw between practicality and luxury when we're in the luxury segment? Because pretty much every other car I know of in this range has lumbar support in both seats. Kind of seems like uh, they just don't have the parts or something. I, I don't know. It, I, I wish they would be a little bit more transparent. Would love to get your thoughts on it uh, and on anything similar to this where we're kind of looking at that line between luxury and practicality in this space. Thanks for the show. You're doing a great job. Love listening every week. Nathan, naming your Daisy after my Daisy might be the single most flattering thing anyone has ever said to me. Uh, I would love for you to email me a picture of your pup if you get a chance, and I promise I won't tell your wife, although I guess you better make sure not to play this episode in the car if she's with you. But to your point, uh, I think it's a very valid one. Where indeed is that line? If I try to put on my Think Like Tesla hat, which I like to think fits me pretty well based on how closely I follow the company, I feel like they'd say that they don't even think of themselves as being in the luxury segment, uh, that that's something the market labels, but they don't really care about. And if they did say that, they wouldn't necessarily be right or wrong, but you'd certainly be free to agree or disagree with them on that. The bottom line, getting back to your thoughts on this, is that I agree with you that there is a line. Tesla would say, okay, maybe not say, but probably think, that it doesn't really matter as long as they continue to sell every car they can possibly make. But I'm with you that it does matter. Maybe not specifically on this lumbar thing, but maybe the next thing, or the thing after, or the collective result of numerous feature deletions like this. Let's hope that we don't find ourselves having that conversation at some point. 
Thank you very much for your call. Here's Tesla Hitchhiker 42 talking Cybertruck. Hi, Ryan. This is Tesla Hitchhiker 42, and I've got a question slash concern about the Cybertruck. So I'm going to be buying my first Tesla sometime in the next couple of years, and I'm trying to decide between the Model Y and the Cybertruck. Now, I would love to get the Cybertruck for a long string of reasons that includes the fact that it looks so ridiculous it just makes me laugh. But I'm concerned that having the Cybertruck isn't going to be the same as having a different Tesla model in the way other people treat me in my car. Because when people see a Tesla, they normally think like, ooh, cool car, you know. But I'm afraid that when they see the Cybertruck, since it's so aggressive and different and... It's such a show-off tank on wheels, you know. People are going to just think, like, a-hole. Like, and I'm wondering, is, is this a legitimate concern? Or have I just got the general populace's perception of the Cybertruck all wrong? Um, yeah, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts, Ryan. And thoughts of anyone who's listening, if they have feedback. Anyway, thanks for the wonderful podcast. And give Daisy a hug for me. All right, bye. It's great to hear from you, Tesla Hitchhiker, and thank you for calling in. My honest opinion, as somebody who had a DeLorean when he was 19 years old, because I caught the values when they were basically at their lowest, is this. Who cares what other people think? If you want a Cybertruck and it means something special to you, as I can relate because the DeLorean always meant something special to me since I first saw it in Back to the Future as a little kid, then that's all that matters. And you should get one and you should enjoy the heck out of it. Now, I realize there can be more to it than that in the real world. There are legitimate concerns in some areas, in some ways, about driving something like that. I have had those same thoughts about the Tesla Roadster. But at the end of the day, there will soon, sooner than we really think, be hundreds of thousands of Cybertrucks on the road. So why not you? You should be one of them. If you love it, go for it. And if anyone ever says anything to you about it, just be self-deprecating about it and roll with it. I cannot tell you how many times I got the, so does it snort the white lines in the road with the DeLorean, or so is all the cocaine hidden in the doors. Those jokes, I heard them all the time about the DeLorean. I mean, most people were pretty enthusiastic and pretty positive about the car, but I definitely heard that stuff a lot over the years. But to me, that says more about those people than it does about you. I mean, you just made me imagine a scenario, by the way. And maybe this is unrealistic, but, you know, we've heard how tough the Cybertruck is. We saw Franz take a hammer to it. So let's say in, in, the, in two, three years from now, you've got your Cybertruck. Somebody comes up to you and says something negative, says something ridiculous, whatever. You turn to them and just say, hey, if you hate this thing so much, Why don't you go ahead and just kick it, get it out of your system, like literally kick it. Go ahead, kick it. And then they won't because they'll be, there's no way they're going to actually take you up on that. But even if they did, nothing would happen. It would be totally fine. But uh, what you could do then, you could kick it because they won't. You could just be like, fine, I'll kick it. And then you kick the body of the truck and nothing happens. And then boom, the situation is instantly diffused And that person probably walks away either laughing with you, having a good time with it, or they slink away with their tail between their legs. So just my two cents. I hope that helps you. Mark from Richmond Hill, Georgia is up next. Hey, Ryan. Mark here from Richmond Hill, Georgia. I've been listening for quite a while since episode 200 with Elon, uh, but I'm a first time caller. Uh, My question are about the Cybertruck and full um, FSD pre-orders. I originally had two reservations, a single motor and a dual motor configuration. Um, with the possible tax credit and rebate of 10000 on the horizon, I decided to change my single motor reservation into a tri-motor reservation. My thought is that a tri-mo- tri-motor Model S Plaid goes for about 130 k but a tri-motor Cybertruck with 500 miles plus range could cost as little as 59900 with the incentive for EVs. I mean, what a deal. Uh, so my first question is, by selecting FSD option in my pre-order, do you think Tesla will hold me to that purchase of FSD if I change my mind when it comes time to complete the purchase? 
I'd like to lock in the current pricing of FSD in the event the cost goes up again, but honestly, if I pull the trigger on a uh, tri-motor, I may not be able to afford the FSD. Should I select the FSD anyways or configure it exactly as I intend to purchase it? Lastly, do you think Tesla will prioritize reservations with FSD uh, selected knowing that the profit margin is higher? Uh, Well, thanks for all you do. Uh, Keep up the great work. Uh, I am active duty military deploying next week, and I do believe by the time I return, the Cybertruck should be, um, you know, coming off the production line, and I just can't wait. Uh, So thanks again, Ryan. Look forward to listening just as I do every Sunday. Take care. Mark, I mean this with all sincerity. Thank you for your service to our country, and please get home safely. I believe I can answer your questions fairly confidently here. First, you should be able to remove full self-driving any time prior to your Cybertruck being officially moved into production, but obviously if you do so, you're going to lose the lower price that you locked it in at, so just keep that in mind. Second, I'm not sure Tesla would ever admit that they were prioritizing tri-motor Cybertruck orders with FSD, but I think your brain is exactly in the right place on that. They probably will for the very reason that you mentioned. Elon has said repeatedly in the past that the most expensive versions of any model that Tesla makes are the first ones off the line because they're the slowest to be built and the ones made before they've discovered efficiencies to bring the cost of the vehicle down. So yes, I would not be surprised at all if most, if not maybe even all of the initial Cybertruck deliveries have that FSD package enabled on them. I appreciate you calling in. Thank you. Jason from Newport Beach is up next. Hi, Ryan. Jason from Newport Beach here. I have a 2018 Tesla Model 3 Performance, just like you, but I have not upgraded my hardware, so I'm on uh, hardware 2.5. With the change in Tesla to a vision-based autopilot system, does that mean future development of autopilot for those of us with the 2.5 computer is effectively suspended? Will we continue to still use radar like we always have? I'm just curious what happens to those of us who are not on the latest hardware in light of the changes Tesla has announced. Thanks. Bye. That really is a great question, Jason, and I wish I had an answer. What I can tell you is that at the very least, your radar is still going to get used. I think the way Elon had been phrasing it, it seemed like, at least to me, maybe I was misinterpreting, that radar was going to get turned off for the existing fleet. But according to white hat hacker Green the Only, who I've mentioned on this show a number of times, that is not the case. He responded to somebody asking about this on Twitter recently. Somebody had said to him, I was under the impression that Tesla was turning off the radar and would only use cameras and ultrasonic sensors. Green responded, that impression is incorrect. The radar is still in use on radar-equipped cars. You can trivially verify this by installing this firmware and observe there's no degradation of AP capabilities compared to true radarless cars, end quote there. Now, maybe that will change, but for now, there you go. Still, I realize that does not fully get to your question, Jason. Basic autopilot might not use all eight cameras, but many people, perhaps including yourself, have the aforementioned enhanced autopilot and are still on hardware 2.5? That is a good question. I'm pretty sure the answer is you need 3.0. I feel like Elon might have mentioned that on Twitter recently, but um, Tesla may decide and perhaps has decided to just move forward from here that, that that says, hey, we're you know, kind of like with old iPhones, right? Like Apple will support back a few iPhones, but eventually... You know, new games, new software doesn't support older models, and they may have decided to do that with regard to autopilot here and deciding, hey, everybody that wants the full feature set needs to have the Hardware 3 computer. All right, I've got uh, one more call this week, and it is an interesting one. Ryan from Las Vegas got to go through and experience the boring tunnel that was recently completed in Las Vegas. So here is Ryan from Las Vegas' report on that. Hey Ryan, this is Ryan from Las Vegas. I wanted to talk about my experience at 
the Vegas Loop, which is by the Boring Company. It's the underground tunnels under the Las Vegas Convention Center. I was able to experience it two times, and I just recently went there today during a convention. First, there's three stations, a West, Central, and East station. The Central station is the one you've seen online, which is underground, and the East and West are above ground. When you get to one of the stations, there's Teslas queued up. The driver told me it's different cars each day, so there was a Model Y there. So you get in, and they drive you underground. It's extremely fast. Usually it would take... 10 minutes to walk from west to central, and then it would take up to 30 minutes to go through the convention center to the east station. But it took under one minute to get from the west to central station, extremely fast underground. Additionally, how it works, they had a iPad mini under their main screen, and it alerts them to anything that goes on in the tunnel. So if there's a backup, it'll tell them. They also have headsets on during the trip, So there were drivers who were driving the cars. They drove on the average 40 miles per hour inside the tunnel. Later though, I know they're testing autopilot that it will be fully autonomous cars. Finally, that tunnel is not just in the convention center. There's plans to go from the airport and go to the most popular casinos as well as downtown Las Vegas. Supposedly, That will come very soon, as I've heard rumblings that some of the casinos have already built out their underground entrances to the Boring Company's loop. After experiencing this, it definitely seems like the future for transportation. On top of that, an amazing advertisement for Tesla Motor Company. I plan on reporting back here if it updates to fully autonomous and also if extra stations come online. Appreciate your podcast and have a great day. It is awesome to hear some firsthand experience of this, Ryan. Thank you very, very much for your call. It's crazy to me that they're aiming to get these up over a hundred miles an hour in the little tunnel. That is so cool. And I say about all this good on Las Vegas. They're embracing the future. I mean, how fantastic will that be to be able to get from the airport and the convention center up and down the strip in a quiet, zero-emission, air-conditioned, underground Tesla in a tunnel? You know, a Tesla that's underground in a tunnel, particularly in the summertime months when it's scorching in Las Vegas. So I hope that Vegas inspires other cities to do the same. Hey, what's up, Seattle? You could use it for going from from uh, one sort of one end of uh, town to the other across the, the the bay there, and Austin could probably use this. I hear some pretty wicked things about the traffic going on down there. Those two come to mind. I'm sure there are plenty of other cities that could make really good use of the Boring Company tunnel system. But how cool that you got to experience this, Ryan. Thank you again. And that is uh, all I've got time for as far as Ride the Lightning Hotline calls. But again, keep your calls coming. I gave you the two easy call-in methods at the top of this segment, so refer back to those if you'd like to give me a ring. And otherwise, stick around. The show is not quite over. I've got your pro tip of the week and a little bit more coming up right after this. Before I give you the pro tip of the week, I just want to say that it was really great to see Gil from San Diego, Kaz from San Diego, and Ben Sullins from Teslanomics while I was down here in San Diego. Uh, Love seeing all those wonderful folks. In fact, Gil I had not met in person before, only on the uh, monthly Patreon Google Hangout as on a computer screen. So really, really fun to spend some time with each of those guys while I was down here. All right, pro tip of the week. It's Len from Michigan. Go ahead, Len. Hi, Ryan. This is Len from Michigan with a pro tip for folks using the newer Tesla high-powered wall charger, which has Wi-Fi connectivity. My internet provider is Xfinity, and my Tesla charger is located in my garage, which is too far away from the Xfinity gateway in my basement. I bought a Wi-Fi extender device, which Xfinity calls a pod. 
it does a good job of strengthening the signal. With the pod up and running, I get consistently fast download speeds in my garage, which I can measure using the Ookla speed test app on my iPhone in the vicinity of my wall charger. Likewise, my Tesla wall charger sees the same strong signal from the pod and is able to connect to that instead of the weaker gateway signal. But an issue occurred after a power outage caused every electrical device in my house to shut down. After power was restored, the Tesla wall charger inadvertently reconnected directly to the weak Wi-Fi signal from the gateway, presumably because the pod device has, had not yet finished its boot-up sequence. To rectify, I simply switched off the 60-amp breaker for the wall charger, then switched it back on again. That forced the charger to reboot, and this time it reconnected with the stronger pod signal. I verified this through an app that Xfinity provides, which lets me see which Wi-Fi devices in my home are connected via the pod versus the gateway. So after a power outage, you might not realize your wall charger is limping along on a weak Wi-Fi signal, even though a stronger signal is available. FYI, I ordered a Model Y long range and it will be delivered next week. Very excited. But presumably the same issue could occur with the vehicle's Wi-Fi connectivity. So I hope folks find this tip useful. Thanks, Ryan, for your great podcast and all you do for us out here in Tesla land. Take care. Len, thank you very much. I love how that new Gen 3 wall connector has a lot of remote and power management features built into it. And hey, congratulations on your imminent Model Y delivery, by the way. Again, if anybody out there has a pro tip of the week, ring me up. Same way that you send in the regular hotline calls. Something interesting, something unique, some little shortcut you found in your car that you think your fellow owners and enthusiasts might enjoy. Drop me a line. All right, before I go, let me mention some friends of Ride the Lightning. First up, we've got, of course, abstractocean.com, makers of many dozens of fine aftermarket accessories. Look them up abstractocean.com. Use the coupon code RTLPODCAST at checkout to get 15% off of your first order. They've got the all kinds of lighting kits. They've got the tempered glass screen protectors, center console wraps, uh, dash trim wraps, all kinds of great stuff. Just, just browse around there, see what you like. And again, RTL podcast, all one word. That is the coupon code to use to get 15% off of your first order. How about the snap plate, which you can get at everyamp.com slash RTL. That's everyamp.com slash RTL. The front license plate bracket for people like me and perhaps like you that hate having to do a front license plate but are going to do it anyway it goes on and off in seconds, but it snaps on and off securely. It's paint safe, grill safe, radiator safe, autopilot safe. There's no double-sided adhe automotive adhesive involved. So if you got to do a front plate, this is the one you want to get. Everyamp.com slash RTL. For any of the Teslas, by the way, S, X, 3, or Y. Meanwhile, if you are in the San Francisco Bay Area or going to be there with your car, and you want to get some excellent detail work done, I cannot recommend Immaculate Reflections enough. They are, uh, they, it's Jeff. <laughs> I mean, he has an assistant, but uh, yeah, it's Jeff and his uh, his assistant. They He just works, he works wonderful, wonderful little miracles in the, in the, uh, detailing department on the car. My car, if you have, if you ever get a chance to see it, is is rolling proof of that. Paint protection film over some or all of the car. That's one thing you could do. You could do ceramic coating so that you don't have to wax the thing for the next three to five years. Or you could do, and or, you could do paint correction to take any little flaws out of the paint. So the website is irdetailing.com. Check it out. Look up Jeff. Drop him a line, book in with him because he is booking up here as the, the summer kicks in. So uh, you want to get on his calendar sooner rather than later and mention that you are a Ride the Lightning listener and you will get a nice little discount on any work that you have done to your car. How about puretesla.com slash RTL? That's your one-stop shop for your dash cam and sentry mode needs. It's simple, 128 gigabyte micro SD base kit 
that plugs into any USB port in your car, 49 bucks, and they ship for free anywhere in the United States. It really could not be simpler than that. So go to puretesla.com slash RTL and order your kit today, and then you will never have to worry about the dash cam and sentry mode again because it will always be there for you and always be running and always be rolling just in case you ever need it, and hopefully you won't. And then Jada. Jada's product line continues to grow. They've got the, I think last week I mentioned the Jada tray that sits in the center of the, the down in your center console, kind of splits it in half horizontally. And it's uh, it has integrated wireless charging for your Apple AirPods or your Pixel Buds and a watch, a smart watch charger built into it, plus just some nice organizing stuff for, you know, if you're putting any coins in there or what have you. So I'm into that. They were nice enough to send me one of those. Of course, the Jada wireless charging pad being the product that I recommend the most from them. They're up to version four of that. They've also got the USB hub console that's basically, it's most of their products rolled into one. So that's pretty sweet if you just want to do a kind of a one, one shot deal on that. Use the coupon code RTL with any of that stuff and they will, you'll get a nice discount there. The link to use, if you wouldn't mind, please use my referral link here. It's getjada.com slash ref slash eight. Full transparency, they'll throw me a couple of bucks from the sale if you happen to go in and buy something through that referral link. And I think that's just about it. If you are not following slash subscribing slash whatever they're calling it these days, the podcast, please do so on your favorite podcast service, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Spotify, those latter two of which are built straight into your car so you can listen natively right in your Tesla. Or you can also find me on YouTube. It's just audio. There's no video, but if that's where you'd prefer to listen, just search Ride the Lightning Tesla on YouTube. You'll find my channel and you can easily subscribe right there. Finally, the Patreon. Uh, Every week, a lot of time and energy goes into this. I mean, as I said, here I am on vacation, still doing the show. I I do that to, again, I am committed to delivering this podcast to you every single week, no matter what, at the same time, on the same day. So, you know, again, uh, I hope that effort does not go unrecognized. You you don't, it's optional to do Patreon. You, you know, the show is always going to be free. It's never going to be behind a paywall. But the idea of the Patreon is that you can voluntarily support my efforts. And in return, you'll get a few perks, perks that stack up the higher you go as far as the support tiers. So there's the $5 basics tier, which I think I call the sport tier, you know, naming it after all the Tesla drive modes. The sport tier is five bucks a month and you'll get early access to each week's show in addition to supporting me, which I would genuinely appreciate. Then it goes up. There's, you know, the, the next tier has, get you get the bonus mini episode each month. And then it goes up to the, uh, of course, the the shout out that you get each week, plus the m- bonus mini episode, plus the early access on up to the monthly Google Hangout with myself and the fellow, your fellow maximum plaid tier folks. So anyway, uh, I, I would be humbled if you would take a look and maybe consider support at some point. The website is patreon.com slash Tesla podcast, Patreon spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And now I want to say hello and thank you to all of the top tier Patreon supporters, starting with the Roadster in Space tier and the newest backer there who goes by the username Crafty Geek. Crafty Geek, thank you so much for your extremely generous support. And then the rest of the Roadster in Space crew, Pete White, Lyle Austin, Steve Radspinner, my friend on Twitter, at Rodam, Fernando Cordero, Lawton from Chicago, Sean Neidig, Scooter Ward, Neil Weaver, and Jackson Wallace. Thanks to all of you. And then the Maximum Plaid tier, we have Jonathan Wales, Cameron Clark, Daniel Grummer, Seth Capello, Nick and Tony, Tesla Hitchhiker 42, who you heard from earlier in the show, John Schmidt, Stan Roth, Howard Anthony Smith, Charles Galpin, Ryan from Las Vegas, Darren Nickel, Kaz Barnes, Ulrich Lassa, Brett Libano, Patrick Wisniewski, Gil Cabrera, Hay Watley, 
Eric Brown, Mark Eversole, Todd Badger, Joe Edgel, Kevin Yank, the Tesla Owners Club of San Joaquin Valley, Michael Williams, MT, Will Stedman, Tyler Smith, Mait Suaru, Derek Nesselrote, Justin Perez, Jeremy Harris, Chris Beach, Tom Mills, and Alex Brem. Thank you all very much. And by the way, the next Maximum Plaid Google Hangout is, uh, I think I think I'm not going to do it next weekend because it's 4th of July weekend and I think people are going to be traveling, people will be busy. So I'll send out an email in about a week from now and aim to do it probably on, I guess, Sunday the 11th. I think so. Keep an eye, an email out, an, uh, an eye out for an email as well as a calendar invite there. Also, I should mention that anybody who either upgrades their existing pledge or pledges for the first time gets a one-time welcome invitation to that monthly hangout. So you can come, come hang out, say hi, and, uh, and have fun with us. And then finally, the Plaid Level supporters, thank you so much to George Cassiopo, David Brander, Alexi Heft, Logan Willis, Jason Chalukas, Tim Hyde, Peter Chalet, Eric Randolph, David Nondahl, Jerry and Mary Smith, Joel Sapp, Dory and Steve Guberman, Jeremy, Tesla Owners Taiwan, Ron Lee, John Cody, Charlie Gillespie, David Perella, Sunil Joseph, Dennis Peake, Stig Mickey Jensen, Jeff Angwin, Chase Cabanillas, The Lydia Family, Michael Regal, Aaron Altschul, Jared Brown, Jerome Strack, Jamie Dalton, Noel and Lucy Murphy, The Tesla Owners East Bay Club, Paul Casarino, Ryan Natchett, Mike and Barbara from Louisville, David J. Howes, Travis Krenzel, Matt Nixon, the Tesla Owners Club of Wisconsin, Jonathan Zelezny, Joshua Walker, and Rick Dean. Thank you, all of you, for your kind and ongoing support of my podcasting efforts here, week in and week out. All right, that will about do it for the 308th edition of Ride the Lightning, your weekly Tesla unofficial podcast. My name, of course, is Ryan McCaffrey. If you've made it this far, you probably know that. Uh, And so I'll say, happy electric motoring, and I will see you back here, of course, same time, same day, next week. I mean, I think a Tesla is the most fun thing you could possibly buy ever. That's what it's meant to be. Our goal is to make... It's, it's not exactly a car. It's actually a thing to maximize enjoyment. It's maximum fun.